Yeah. Good evening. I uh, just want to say good evening from here, Cornerstone Mountain Assembly in Grand Cash. Uh, good evening to all our online church family and our families that are somehow not here tonight due to some other unavoidable circumstances. And uh, tonight we just want to say we thank God for his faithfulness, we thank God for his mercy, we thank God for his grace, we thank God for the gift of life, and we thank God for summer. Uh, summer uh, vacation is over, and now we are entering into a new quarter. And tonight we are starting a new uh, Bible uh, series for this quarter for the next three months. Uh, it's more of a foundational class Bible study, and I think it will be more of a refresher uh, study for those who have been in the church for long, who has saved, who knows that, and also for our new believers in the Lord, that uh, with all the business of life, especially in our culture today, uh, we really don't have time for in-depth Bible studies in our church. So this is going to afford us the opportunity to learn some things and just get us familiar with uh, some basic uh, biblical doctrines that is good for our faith and our lives. And uh, we just want to say thank you, Jesus, as we pray. We we'll thank you for the opportunity to be alive. We we'll thank you to be counted among the living. We we'll thank you, Father God, for the hope that we have in Christ. We we'll thank you, Lord, that indeed absence from the body is presence with you. And so, Father God, in all things, we give you thanks because we know that is your will consigning us. Heavenly Father God, as we process and go through this new season, we ask for your peace, we ask for your presence. For those who cannot be here for unavoidable reasons, we pray for your comfort and strength upon them, both spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, and otherwise. We cover the airways with the blood of Jesus, and we pray for your divine intervention. And we pray for that God, that hope will continue to rise in the heart of your children in the midst of tears and grief. We thank you, eternal rock of ages, for being so kind and gracious. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Right, so like I was saying, uh, tonight, we'll, the New Bible series, I just uh, term it, New Life, New Beginning. A new Life in Christ, a New Beginning. And um, God willing, we will be, by the grace of God, our study this quarter will focus on some foundational truth that makes for a stable, strong Christian life and Christian living. And like I said, some of us uh, who have been around in the church for a while are familiar with this and have gone through this, both uh, theoretically and practically, and then some of us have not. Uh, and it will also surprise us to know that in today's culture, you can have some people in a church leadership position who don't even know the basic fundamental of what it even means to be a Christian and to be saved. And I think uh, the lack of proper teaching also can be responsible for a lot of rascality that we have in the body of Christ today. And people trying to misinterpret and misrepresent the scripture because they were not properly taught. And so this is one of the reasons why. So this study will make us and help us to be stable and strong Christian and having a strong life. Our Bible study by the grace of God shall be in this order. Uh, we will start with the doctrine of repentance, what it means to repent. Repent, we hear it, and that is how Jesus started his ministry. Repent, for the kingdom of God is here. John the Baptist, the same thing. Repent, for the kingdom of God is here. The prophet of old, and if you listen, follow the prophet of old in the Old Testament, the theme of their message is always repentance, turning away from our wrong ways into the right way, into right fellowship with God. 
and it, it is becoming more like repent is becoming more like a swear word. Again, it can, very soon, if we're not careful, it may even become an offensive word in some uh, congregation because why should you tell me to repent and things like that. But that is part of the doctrine that a lot of people don't know. And then when we're done for our repentance, we'll be going to uh, new birth because repentance leads to new birth in Christ. And when a man has experienced that new birth, the next thing is justification. And after justification, when you're justified, you want to be consecrated unto the Lord, and consecration leads to sanctification. And these are themes, these are words that are no longer familiar in the body of Christ today. And I believe that as we are, as the race is getting tougher, and the atmosphere spiritually is becoming intense, and the persecution of the church is becoming more. And we see that the coming, the last days, I think it's no longer the last days. We are in the last hour. Amen. And uh, so it's needful for you and me to go back to the basis so that we can make uh, our salvation sure. <clears throat> okay, so back again to our study here. Why do we need to study some of the above topics? topic someone may ask. They should be told, we have many in the church who do not understand the working of the kingdom of God, which they claim to be a part of, just like I was saying at the beginning. Talk more of what is expected of them as believers. Because if I've not gone through it, if I don't know what it means to be a believer, to be a follower of Christ, and this is why a lot of people think that, okay, because they come to church and you try to tell them certain things and they get very angry and get offended, right? Because they don't even know what the kingdom, you know, where they are, you know, they don't understand the etiquettes, the spiritual etiquettes of the kingdom that they belong in. And a, a lot of people, sorry for that, a lot of people say they are Christians and they don't even want to have anything to do with the Bible. They don't want to have anything to do with the Bible, and which is strange, and and they argue and contest the need the truth, you know, the Word of God. But if you are taught well, you will know that some of the things that we fight and protest against is uncalled for. Amen. And this is one of the reasons why we'll be doing this series, God willing. So it will also surprise you to know that we still have many people who are in the church, but they are not in Christ, meaning that they are not truly saved, right? They, they, they may be in the church, but they are not in Christ. They go to church, and they can even stand on the pulpit on a Sunday to even preach, but they are not in Christ. They have not fully experience that life transforming encounter and conversion and true repentance has not taken place in their heart and many may not even have the opportunity to know or to experience what it means to repent amen okay let's now go to our bible uh, uh, reading tonight as we continue with this uh, stop here and then I just want to do that to read the scripture. John chapter 3, from verse 1 to 10. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Verse 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Talk more of entering. Verse 4, Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except 
a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listed, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every man that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can this be? How can these things be? Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto him, Thou art the master, and thou art the master of Israel, and knowest not these things. And this same question can be directed, verse 10 can be directed to me today. And you are a pastor preaching every Sunday and you don't know this thing. And you were a, 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 a music minister uh, leading the chorus in the church and you don't know this thing. You are a Sunday school teacher and you don't know this thing. You are a deacon in the church and you don't know these things. You're a professor of theology and you do not know these things. And it's possible that I can be all of that and still do not know what Jesus was talking about just as Nicodemus was ignorant of what it means to be totally transformed by the power of the Spirit of God. All right, the third paragraph you note there. Like Nicodemus, many people have no idea what it means to be saved and truly living for Christ Jesus today. They may be a big part of the church culture, yet have no personal relationship with the person of Jesus, the builder of the church. And this is where it is very scary, especially in this hour where we are. And, um, you know, uh, we eschatology, the teaching of end time and the prediction of end time and, and where people, uh, the doctrine of the last days, uh, which has become a ministry for some people, which is wonderful. And where a lot of us will say, oh, I'm um, post-tribulation, I'm um, pre-tribulation. And anytime people ask me, which one are you? And I'm saying, be ready for the kingdom of God is at hand. No one knows the hour nor the time. I, 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 it's good if you know all the signs, but what is the use of knowing all those signs and you are not even ready? Right? It will come like a thief in the night. It's either he comes or we go and meet him there. Right? That appointment is unavoidable. It's inevitable. It's appointed unto man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Right? I would rather study how to be ready in season and out of season than to uh, be, uh, be, have this kind of personal deception based on the study of times and season that gives me the idea that I still have six more years before Jesus come, or ten more years before Jesus come. Right? You know, just like uh, the, the incident that we, uh, we experienced in, in our congregation here uh, a few days ago. That is rapture. That is translation. All right? You know, no, no hour, no reason. There is no warning. You, you know what I mean? And boom. And it can be any time now. And this is why we need to be ready. Pastor, yes, ma'am. I had this conversation the other day about what does it mean uh, to be saved by God. When I was just young and married, maybe I was just dating David, I can't remember. Right. Norma talked about salvation. Say, being saved, and it's like, saved from what? Right. Because nobody told me right. sin. Right. Right. Sin. sin. Right. And so I didn't know what. Right. What. Right. And it's only as I got to know, I mean. Now, let me ask. That was how long ago? Oh, 47, 48 years ago. I, I, do you know why I asked you that question? I asked that question. 
that even 47 years ago, you didn't even know. Now, it's even worse now. That's my point. It's worse now. This is a point. There are a lot of people, because the idea of preaching the raw biblical salvation message is termed offensive to many people in many quarters, even in many pulpit. Because to call sin, sin, you're going you're gonna to chase people away. You know what I mean? You, you're going to be, I keep forgetting, you know, uh, if you talk about sin, your church will not be relevant. It's not going to be attractive. You're going to change, you, you know, people will not be interested. You know, you're going to threaten, you, you know, you, you, you are labeling people. Everybody says, oh, I'm a good right. But sin is sin. Because for you to be, because I need to know that I'm a sinner who is in need of a savior. If I don't know that I'm a sinner, then I don't need a savior. You know, and we started, they started years ago, and they begin to uh, modernize and glamorize sin. You know, when, okay, adultery, you know, when you call it adultery, it's offensive. If you say they had an affair, that is cool. You know what I mean? It just, <laughs> you know what I mean? It just becomes very tolerable and acceptable. And then it's no longer offensive. And so when we begin to, you know, define things to suit us, then we are now in trouble and we need a savior. And so a lot of people will come to church and go to be in the church for years and get used to the church culture without being introduced to the person of Jesus. And it's dangerous and it's sad. And so we have so many people in the church today who do not understand the true meaning of repentance. We are not talking about the people outside because they don't even know anything at all. all right? And you can meet, because like you said the word there, I'm a good person. If I've been coming to church for two, three years and suddenly you tell me, man, you need to get born again. What are you saying? Are you insulting me? I'm a good person. I've been part of this church culture. I know how to pray. I've learned some Bible verses. I've memorized some scriptures. So I'm good to go. They don't know what it means. They don't know the true meaning of repentance in Christ. What it really means to be born again, to turn a new leaf. What it means to be truly transformed from the inside out through genuine repentance by believing and giving their lives over to the Lord Jesus. I purposely use the Lord Jesus there, not God, because you see, Lord means when you say somebody is your Lord, that means you have ceded complete ownership, your right over to him. To be Lord over you. And so if Jesus is my Lord, then he owns me. He becomes my Adonai, the one who owns me. This is the air I breathe. It's everything that we have. And so then we are, our life is governed by the dictates of his words. So in verse 4 of chapter 3, John, where we read, Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again? Just like uh, Sister Melody said, and said, Okay, what do I need to be saved from? Indirectly. And sometimes people sincerely need to ask that question because they don't even know that they have a problem. Because if you've never pointed my problem to me, then I think everything is okay. If, if so, we need to know. And he asked a question. He said, what, how can I be born again? And also that also give us another flip side to that question. You know how people say, I am born that way. I was born that way. I, it's always very interesting for me when I hear that. And I say, oh, that's wonderful. And that means there is hope. <laughs> 
Because we are all victims of being born that way. And God acknowledges that. He doesn't even deny the fact that I was born this way. But he's saying, then what created my problem was the way I was born. And the only way I can be free from where I am now is to what? Be born again. <laughs> so being born that way is not a problem. But God saying, being born that way, it's okay. I have a solution for this problem. Be born again. Be reborn. And he said, oh, how can this be? I'm too old now. Am I going to go back again to my mother's womb and be born again? He said, no, no. There is a different kind of womb. And we will know, though, that in us there is the spirit, soul, and body. Do they know that? Uh, some don't, some do. Some don't. Right. They, they, they know their mind, they know their body, but they don't know the spirit. Right, and the soul. Right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And, and this is where it becomes interesting. And where Jesus said, unless a man is born of the spirit and of the water, unless a man goes back into the womb of the spirit and be reborn. By that deliberate choice, you cannot be coerced into doing it. You cannot be manipulated into doing it. You cannot be threatened into doing it. You have to choose to want to. You have to be brought to the point whereby your, your brokenness is revealed to you by the Spirit of God, via the agency of the Word of God, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. Yeah, yeah that's, what the, oh, all right. that's what the world calls it. That's the way they, they think of it. But because they don't know that this is the spirit man at work. Right. right. Yeah. And, 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 and the spirit and the soul, you know, the, the engine of the soul is the spirit. You know, the, uh, if, you, if we go back a little bit and just to, uh, I'll, I'll read this and I'll see what I want to see here. Say, though we do not go back a second time into our mother's womb, we still need to go back into the womb of the Holy Spirit to be reborn. This is repentance. You, you remember in Genesis, and the Bible says, and the Lord breathed or breathed into a man, and the man became what? A living soul. And so the breath of God, which is the Spirit of God in man, right, is God's own personal property. And it is that that the enemy choose sin contaminates. And when that spirit of God in man, the bread of God in me is contaminated through wrong choices, wrong uh, bathing, let me use that word, you know, then it becomes lost, shallow, broken, and battered. And so Ezekiel chapter 18 said something very interesting. He says, the soul that sin it shall die. He didn't say the man. <laughs> right? Because death, when the Holy Spirit, and when I got this understanding years ago, it just blew my head. And when I saw that, God breathed into me. I became a living soul, not a living man. The soul that sin it dies. And scientifically and otherwise, death is actually defined, literally this way, academically, that death is when an object loses correspondence 
with its natural habitation. And so let me explain. When you take a fish out of the water, the water is its natural habitation. When you take a fish out of the water, right, you don't even have to do anything to that fish. Just leave it outside for a while. What happened? He dies. What killed that fish was that he lost correspondence with his natural habitation. When you take a bird from the tree, which is his natural habitation, and stuff his head in the water, give it a few minutes. It's going to die because you have separated that fish or that bird from its natural habitation. What sin does to us, this is why we need to repent and we are in need of repentance because the breath of God belongs to God. And so this soul, my natural habitation is with God. And so death, hell, hell in of itself, you know, the, the illustration and the description of hell as fire and brimstone does not even describe it well. What, is, what, what makes hell hell is the absence of God. Where there is no God, because when this soul aspires from earth here, this body is put to the ground. It decays. The soul needs a container. And if this soul was already contaminated before this body expires, then the soul is in trouble. Because the first thing is that the soul is trying to go back to its natural habitation, which is God. But it's contaminated, so he cannot inhabit there anymore. And coming back here, there is nobody for that soul to inhabit. And the only place where there is vacancy is where there is no God. That is what they call it hell. And because my soul was not designed to live and thrive without God, that is why it's unimaginable torture and pain. That the only way the scholars and, and the men of old could describe hell was to try to tell us about the fire and the bridge home when there is no water, when the nature not tape, is because I'm now completely separated eternally from my natural habitation. And now this also brings us to another flip side of this issue, this equation. This is why the Bible says something here. Jesus said, there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. You know why? Because every time a soul is eternally separated, a part of God is lost. And so God cannot be happy. That's why God treats the issue of your salvation and my salvation with utmost priority. And this is why you and I cannot take the issue of soul winning psychedelically. It's of great importance. This is why God himself had to come in the likeness of man to die to save man. Does that make, do you see how important? This is why it's important. That's why when Jesus came, the only thing he said is crying, repent, repent, repent. You need to turn. You need to change. You can't go. You cannot remain eternally separated from me. And this is the trick of the devil. Does that make sense now? And so, like we said in our, uh, again, to our note quickly here. Yeah. So, a lot of Christian folks think going to church every once in a while is all they need to make it to heaven or become right in the eyes of God. Right? You know, okay, I go to church every now and again. So church attendance is great. Being involved in church programs and activities is wonderful. Giving money to support the work of God is great. But you can do all this and more and still not be known in heaven. You can be a good man, a good woman. 
until your soul is reconciled back to God through Jesus Christ, you still have not done anything. And this is very important. And this is what repentance is. Repentance is not good works. We do good works because we have repented. <laughs> do you understand the difference now? Repentance is not good works. But when a man has truly, uh, truly repented, he will do good works. And so, my good works is a function of my repentance. But, re but, but good works does not equate repentance. And so we have to tell people not to misplace priorities, not to put the cat before the, the horse, right? Is that how they say it here? Right. And so Matthew chapter 7 is very interesting here, uh, verse 21 to 24. Not everyone that say unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. You see? Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, we have prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Then, will, then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Therefore, whosoever shall hear these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which builds his house upon a rock. Right? Good works is okay, but good works that is not better on true genuine repentance unto God is just charity work. <laughs> Everybody does charity. There are a lot of people who are natural Mm. And they, they're out there assuming well, they, they, they give and they support and right. they work and, and but they still don't realize that if they haven't given their heart to the Lord, that's the qualification. Mm -hmm. They can do all the good works they want and they can run programs and they can, you know, right. whatever. So that's all good works. Right. Good stuff. And it's commendable, but it's commendable to man, but to God, it's doing the will. Jesus says, he who heareth my saying and doeth them. In John, he said, if you love me, keep my commandment. And my commandment are not partisan. And so, living by the dictates of the word of God. Not trying to make the word of God say what you want, but aligning your life to what the word of God says. Because what we do today is to try to get the word of God to align to our own belief, our own ways of life. We try to get the Bible to say what we want to say. But rather, what God wants, what Jesus is saying is here, is that I need to align my life to what he is saying. Not try to reinterpret it and say, what is the Greek meaning of that? What is the, you know, uh, does Jesus really mean? And, and this didn't start from today. It started from the beginning. The story of Adam and Eve, right? Did God really say? <laughs> and is, is that same spirit not at work today in the body of Christ? Is that what the scripture really say? You know, you are reading it from the... Uh, you know, the Greek translation does not, uh, the Hebrew one doesn't really say that. If you read the other original text, they will try to find a way to tell you that it didn't, this is not what God is saying. To justify their ways of life. A repented soul does not justify his sins. A repented soul will not justify his waywardness. A repentant soul will not make excuses for his shortcoming. He will find a way to change. He will cry out, what a wretched soul that I am.
Amen. So we must know that the physical building is not the church. The church is you and I. We are the temple that the Holy Spirit inhabits. And this is why this is the need for repentance. Like we said in the beginning, and God breathed into a man. God inhabited us. Right? Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we have to keep our life in line. You know, so going to church is awesome and it's wonderful. Coming like we're coming together now to build ourselves up is okay. It's beautiful. But there is something bigger than this building. And that is you. There is something more important than this building. And that is you. And you are the biggest church in your community. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are God's mobile house. Do you, understand? you are the ark of God. We are, we are the ark of God. We carry the presence of God with us. We are the ark of God. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 16. He said, know you not that ye are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you. And it is that spirit, like we, uh, you guys were saying at the beginning here, that spirit of man is what sin comes to contaminate. And when the spirit of man, of God in man, is contaminated by compromise and sin, it becomes dead. It, doesn't, it can no longer correspond with God. Because wherever the repentant Christian is, him or her becomes a church. Because a truly repented and changed Christian carry the presence of the Lord with him or her wherever they go. There's a great difference between doing the will of God and walking in our own will and doing our own thing. And all this tonight we're trying to do to lay introduction why repentance is necessary in this last day, why you and I need to change, why the reason why you need to repent, I need to repent. Repent for the kingdom of God is here. Repent for the kingdom of God is here. Repent for the kingdom of God is now. John the Baptist came and said, I am the voice of him crying in the wilderness. Repent. Change your ways. Make a 360 degree turn. Because now is the time of salvation. And so, this is what, uh, and secondly, when we go into the new bed, because repentance leads to new birth. This is the introduction of our classes in the coming weeks. The new birth will help us to walk in the will of the Father. The goal of this study is to give us an opportunity for self as an examination to know if we are truly in the faith or in the faith of our own imagination or creation. Right? This is what God wants us to, I believe that we want to use the next couple of weeks to unravel. You know, Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, he says, examine yourself. And see whether you are still in the faith. <laughs> right? Not a faith. You can be in a faith, not the faith. There are a lot of people of different faith, different persuasion. But the whole thing here that the Holy Spirit is pushing us in a direction where we begin to do a self-examination. Am I in the faith or in the faith? If Jesus should come now, am I ready? Oh, I'm still saying, okay, oh, the rapture is going to take place in five years' time, so let us be waiting. Yeah, it could be. It could be one minute now. But whoever goes tonight, his rapture has happened. And so I would rather study how to be ready now than to keep waiting for five years. I want to be equipped to be ready in season and out of season. And this is what God is leading us to do. 
I believe. So examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own self that Jesus Christ is in you, unless except you are reprobate. Who has a, an IV translation? What other translation do you have that is not King James? Who has a different translation of the Bible? Uh, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5. If you have a different translation from, the, uh, from King James, let me hear it. If you have an IV, ESV. Ampli okay, we'll do the Amplified too. I want to see it. No, Second Corinthians. 13 verse 5. Okay, rest and read yours. Let me hear. Examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. To see whether you are in the faith. To see whether you are in the faith. Test, uh, test, uh, test yourselves. Do not. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Unless, of course, you fail the test. Now, this is nobody, this is not, and God is saying, the Holy Spirit is saying, this is not me telling you, somebody judging you now. Now, stand before yourself and talk to yourself. Now, who are that translation? Let's hear the uh, Amplified. Okay, hold on. Examine, test, and evaluate your own selves. Your own selves. See whether you are holding to your faith. See whether you are holding to your faith. And showing the proper fruits of it. And showing the proper fruit of faith. Test and prove yourself. Test and prove yourself. Do you not yourselves realize and know? Do you not yourself realize and know? That Jesus Christ is in you? Unless you are disapproved on trial and rejected? Unless you are disapproved on trial and rejected. By yourself. Your conscience now. You will know. Are you standing? You know, are you in the number saved by grace? I don't know. They used to sing those songs. Was this one where in high school in Nigeria? Are you in the number saved by grace? <laughs> <laughs> Right? We are saved by grace. And like we've always emphasized here, that grace is not a license to sin. Grace is just what? A line of credit. <laughs> grace is God saying, I'm betting on your future. Grace is not for me to do what I want and say God understands. Grace comes to say, God says, listen, this is not right, but I know you are better than this. And you can do well tomorrow. Amen. Okay. Quickly, this study will also afford us the opportunity to relearn those things we have forgotten. Some of us who know all this about repentance, new birth, sanctification, consecration, and all the whole nine mark. And for some of us, it's going to teach us the simplicity of the gospel and the need to get our spiritual lives in order. The goal of this study is also to allow the Word of God, through the help of the Holy Spirit, bring repentance, not criticism, or negative feeling in us. My prayer is that through the study, through this study, the whole of the Holy Spirit, along with the Word of God, will bring conviction to our hearts and not condemnation. That at the end of the study, the Holy Spirit will humble our heart by allowing the Word of life to bring lasting changes to our hearts and not challenges to our life. Like Paul says in Colossians chapter 3 verse 16 and love the scripture and he said let this word of Christ dwell richly in you and the indwelling word of God he said teaching us let the word of God dwell richly in you with all wisdom with 
all wisdom. And I love the word wisdom again, a little bit an academic exercise here. The literal definition of wisdom simply means applied knowledge. And the Bible say Jesus is the wisdom of God. And so if Jesus is dwelling in you and me richly, it just simply means that I will begin to apply living out the life of Christ. I become the exact representation of Christ in my family, in my community, in my workplace, in my neighborhood, that when they see me, they have seen him. And this is all, this is what the word of God does. The word of God is not for me to argue. It is not for me to debate. It is for me to leave. <laughs> right? And so sometimes, like a lot of people, they come in with all their Greek and mean. I don't argue anything with people. I believe what I believe. You believe what you want. Right? God didn't call me to argue the word of God. A man asked me years ago, a pastor, he said, uh, and he uh, talking about some of this controversial topic, and he said, what is your opinion about that? And I said, I'm too small to have opinion on God's word. <laughs> I said, God didn't ask me, didn't call me to have opinion. He called me to believe. And he kind of looked at me. I said, I, said, I don't have, how can I? I said, the Lord is saying something, then I want to have an opinion. I said, that is the height of arrogance. And I can't afford that. I say I'm too small to have an opinion about with God. I want to debate. No, no. You know, so either that we believe or we don't. So finally, we shall together be using the mirror of the Holy Spirit, the word of God, to look at our lives closely again, not in judgment, not in finger pointing or criticism, but in humility of heart for total transformation. This is my prayer, and this is what I'm longing for in this next uh, two months. So uh, as the Lord gives us the grace to start the days, like I said, for some of us, it's going to be a refresher cause, just kind of uh, rekindle some of the things we already know and bring it alive again and things we have forgotten. And to some of us, a new thing is going to, the Holy Spirit is going to unveil certain new things and say, oh, like the songwriter say, it is me, it is me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. This is not about saying, this is somebody. It is about saying, me, I need you, O Lord. I need you. We need to begin to cry out because the time is now, right? For me, this is eschatology 101. This is end time teaching to get us ready for the coming Savior as a bride without spot nor wrinkle. Amen. Our last scripture, James chapter 1, verse 22. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding a natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straight away forget what manner of man he was. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, he, is, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Right? When you behold the mirror of the word, don't forget what the Lord has told you. Don't try to reinterpret it or re explain it in a way to justify your ways. You know, when a man is really ready to change, he does not make excuses. He does not blame anybody. He will say, it is me, O oh Lord. And thank all of you that are watching online. You see a lot of people from uh, Nigeria in particular. Uh, when, and I thank you, Abiola, Ibrahim, Kadena. Uh, Scambo, there's the lift too, I can see, and I know a lot of you out there, and thank you for joining us as we pray tonight, and uh, we're going to be praying, uh, one of our dear family, and uh, we're not calling names, but uh, we're going to be praying for those of us here we know, uh, one of our dear sister was translated uh, on Thursday, and for me, when I think about just her, her going, that's the only word that just comes to my spirit. And she was translated. One of our dear sister was translated uh, to glory on Thursday. 
and it was a translation because and the one thing I noticed I, I, I remember vividly about this dear sister of ours was this I know in the last couple of months you know she was so very militant every time we had done bible study or after church she has time to sit with me and she just said you need to let people know that the days are evil jesus is coming things the signs are everywhere you know and if we want to be a little bit superstitious you say oh maybe she knew <laughs> and it's possible who knows maybe her spirit in her bear witness that she do not know so we know without a shadow of doubt that our dear sister is looking I don't, I don't know if that is how it works. If they can look, if God give them permission to look from heaven, I don't know. The scripture didn't say that. <laughs> so let me not, let me not put a theology that is not scriptural. But if God gives them permission to look down from heaven, and I think she'll be looking this evening and say. Way to go, my people. You guys are just keep the ball rolling and just keep the fire burning. Amen. And I believe that this she's part of the host of heaven now that is cheering us on. And uh, But uh, for the families and the loved ones that she's left behind, they need the comfort of the Holy Spirit uh, as they grieve. The Bible says we grieve with hope. You know, uh, uh, grieving when we lose a loved one is not unbelief. It's not faithlessness. That is, the, that is the theology from hell. You know how they used to tell you, oh, don't cry, you are a child of God. Why wouldn't I cry? And just being separated from somebody that I love. Crying and weeping and sometimes getting angry when your loved one has been translated uh, from you is okay. But we pray that as you grieve, you will grieve with hope, you will grieve with assurance of faith that one day soon, in the by and by, we all be reunited. And so let us pray. We pray for that God will lift the family of our dear sister, her grandchildren, and uh, her children, her spouse, her sisters, her friends of oh God, that uh, the immediate family, Father God, who are greatly impacted by her translation. Lord, even for those of us, her uh, 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 spiritual family that are also deeply affected by her translation. Lord, I pray that you will clothe us, O oh God, with a garment of comfort, with a garment of peace. We pray and lift up, O oh God, the sister in particular and the husband. We cover their heart with the blood of Jesus. We pray for the comfort of the Holy Spirit to rest upon them in the mighty name of Jesus. And we pray, Father God, also that affliction of this kind will not rise a second time, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. And we pray, Father God, because in everything we stay judge you faithful. Lord, we know you are a good God and everything that you do is good. Uh, Heavenly Father God, even in times like this, we refuse to give any credit to the devil that he has. He can't do nothing. Lord, there is nothing that happens to your elect, O oh God, without your knowledge. If you allow it, O oh God, you know something we do not know. And so, Father God, we say thank you for the opportunity, Father God, to have the fellowship that we had with with your daughter for the time that we were together here on this side of heaven. And I pray, Father God, that you continue to strengthen us, O oh God, together with a bond and the cord of love that cannot be broken. We pray, Father God, for every heavy heart, may there be healing. For every discouraged spirit, may there be an upliftment in the mighty name of Jesus. For the one, O oh God, who is stranded, may there be a rescue for them tonight in the name of Jesus. For that need on the altar of your children, Children's heart, be it spiritual, be it financial, be it marital, be it relational, be it health wise. We pray for that God that there will be supernatural intervention in the name of Jesus. Lord, we stretch the rod of faith to your daughter Melody right now in the name of Jesus. Can those of us near her just put your hands on her shoulder there for me? 
gently. Father, in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, God, we release the rod of faith over that arm. Heavenly Father, God, we speak to that bone and we say, Father God, you ask Ezekiel, can this dry bone live? Can this bones be healed? We say, yes, it can be healed and it will be healed. Tonight, Father God, we pray that you will send your angels tonight as she lay to sleep. May your invisible angels, so God, that specialize in the impossible. Father God, come down and perform that surgery and begin to put the bones together in the mighty name of Jesus. Let there be a supernatural turnaround. We speak relief in the name of Jesus. Lord, for the lady, Father God, that had that tumor, that had that issue, that went into surgery today, we pray, Father God, that the end shall be glorious in the name of Jesus. Father God, that through that situation, she will come to know you as the only true God. And we pray for every member of this household that is struggling medically. We pray, Father God, that there will be sweet relief, sweet comfort and healing in the mighty name of Jesus. For those online tonight that are believing you for a visitation, may the Lord God Almighty, who specializes in the impossible, may he show up for you speedily in the name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise. We bless you for being such a wonderful Father, loving and gracious to us. We bless your holy name, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. God bless you. And uh, for those of you, thank you all for joining us again tonight. Uh, we have a service on Sunday. Everything is back now. We are back from our summertime. And now we are getting ready to roll. Amen. So Wednesday, uh, 5.30 is supper. And uh, what we're going to be doing this time is that right after supper, we'll just go into Bible study. So if you're in Grand Cash and you're looking for where to go on Wednesday evening, you are welcome to come in here and join us for a time of fellowship. And on Sunday, uh, we have a wonderful children ministry now. Uh, uh, we have a Sunday school coordinator now for children. And so bring your children to church on Sunday. And there will be wonderful things for them to do. And you will enjoy. So thank you. God bless you. See you on Sunday and next week Wednesday. God bless.